If you've been listening to my show for a while, you know how I like to talk about a gut biome test. I call it a fancy poop test. It's a fancy name for a poop test. And it's going to tell us what the ecosystem is in your gut. And why that's important is since food's the best medicine, it's going to tell us, here are your superfoods just for you to eat. Here are the foods for you to avoid. And here's everything else. Eat this a lot. Eat this a little. Now, my team has been very busy and they got an amazing deal for anybody that wants to do this test. You can do it at home. You don't need a doctor's orders. All you have to do is just go to Viome, V as in Victor, I-O-M as in Mary, E.com biome.com. And at checkout, use the secret code, Julie Ryan, and you'll get more than 50% off. Don't put any spaces in there, just Julie Ryan. It's an amazing test. It's going to give you tons of information. I've done it several times myself, and you're going to be thrilled with the information you get because it'll give you a program just for you. Give it a whirl. Hi, everybody. This is an interview we recorded a couple of years ago, and it's one of my faves, and I think you'll enjoy it too. It's got so much great information in it that if you haven't seen it, please watch it. If you already saw it, please watch it again, because it's kind of like when you watch a movie, you always see things the second or third or 15th time that you didn't see the first time. So I hope you enjoy this chat, and remember to subscribe, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about the interview. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. I'm Julie, your host, and I'm so delighted you could join us this week. My intention in doing this show is to provide information, insight, and comfort to people all around the world by helping to answer life's unanswerable questions. And I have such a treat for you this week. I got Michael Sandler with us. And a lot of you may know of Michael but he's an author, a life coach, a host of one of the top inspirational podcasts on the planet, and he's a survivor. A former professional athlete, Michael, a modern day evil Knievel, has come through, among other things, two near-death experiences, more than a dozen surgeries, financial ruin, and countless other adventures, and lives to tell the tale of how we all have the ability to like him be a phoenix who rises from the ashes to create the life that we want. So, Michael, welcome to the show. I'm so thrilled you're here. Well, thank you so much, Julie, for having me on the show today in a mighty woohoo. So you're my favorite daredevil on the planet. And did you come into this world like this? Or did you develop that skill of just being a daredevil along the way? Or did you come from a daredevil family? I mean, were you guys jumping off cliffs when you were little or what? It's interesting. I wouldn't even call myself a daredevil. Um, I've had a lot of challenging situations in life. I did race bicycles professionally. I did speed skate. I still speed skate. But uh, I'm not the cliff jumper type. I'll sometimes, not sometimes, the last time was living on Maui 10 years ago. I kind of was bummed that that I wouldn't jump off of the cliff, (laughs) that that I was going to stay too grounded. But but my family is definitely a lot more conservative. They're not professional athletes. They, uh, They play things close to the vest and they live a much more traditional lifestyle. Whereas um, I certainly want to see what can we do this lifetime? What can we explore? How can we challenge ourselves? How can we live outside of the box? What is possible? So tell us about your childhood. I mean, were you a kid that was out just exploring things as a kid? Were you kind of shy and, and quiet? I mean, give us an idea of what kind of family you came from and, and how you were as a kid. So how I, okay, those are multiple questions at once. We'll take them, we'll take one at a time. I was the quintessential ADHD child before there was such a diagnosis. Um, I was first, I guess, tested in 75 at five years of age. Then again, in 77, and my parents actually had to sell the house and move to a new school system to be able to get me some treatment for that, which I felt made me into a zombie. I was felt like I was just I was a very sharp, wanting to explore boy who's being forced to sit down in a seat and go really slowly. That didn't work so much for my mind. I was continuously riding the bicycle. I was continuously exercising. That was my, my Ritalin or my Adderall. 
Um, I was very, very sharp. Couldn't think inside of the box. I was um, uh, beaten, bullied, oh. locked in lockers, everything, everything oh. all the way through um, junior high. I guess that finally stopped in high school. In high school, I started coming into my own. I started training to become a professional cyclist. I was involved in drama briefly, but very, very talented in that. I um, became the uh, editor-in-chief of a brand new high school newspaper. I started to shine. I started to thrive. Uh, I went to Europe to race bicycles after, uh, well, I started off at the Colorado College uh, racing bicycles on the track in Colorado Springs, trained at the Olympic Training Center, went to Europe. But backing up in my story, um, it was definitely a square peg round hole with my family who didn't have probably the coping mechanism either to work with such a, a hyperkinetic child or helped create such a hyperkinetic child, whichever way you want to look at the story, because my parents were really challenged. It was a miracle that they stayed together and family and friends or friends at least didn't want to go over to their house because they called it the crazy house. Because uh, there were continuously fights and arguments. Were, were and the fights going and on. arguments and stuff going on over you, or were they just in general? If uh, you had been taken out of the equation, would they have been a normal MO, or were they because of you? Because I did get taken out of the equation when I went to college and my sister was still around for another two years. Mm -hmm. and, and I love you, mom and dad, so I'm not picking on you at all. But my sister would say that the fights absolutely continued. It's just that the focus got turned to her instead it turned to me. And, and that was, and, and we come from generations of um, challenged individuals, not picking on them. I love my parents so, so much and they are so, so awesome but they didn't have the coping mechanisms. And, and so it came out as we had the fighting family. So and when you say they were challenged individuals, what does that mean? Well, that were means they challenged. My mom is, it comes from a family that was fairly dysfunctional where all of the sisters fought, where their mom fought with the sisters and it was very dysfunctional there. My dad comes from a beautiful family where he fell in love with the ocean. And so his dad sent him away to boarding school as far away from the ocean as he could get them. And, and the kids all came out with their own unique challenges. We all have our challenges. They just matched each other's wounds perfectly mm -hmm. um, so that they could have um, an even more stimulating 18 year, 20 years with my sister and myself. And that's the best way I can say it without picking on it. It was a picking on them. It was a very hostile, combative, in, uh, stress filled, environment so where did you go to get peace or did you know how to do that when you were a kid my bicycle was my solace my exercise was my solace nature was my solace um time i started working full time i started working in a caddy shack at 12 and i worked there full time for about six months and then the next year about six months and then i lied and started working full time evenings and weekends for bike shops and like starting at a little over 14. So I had my time out of the house. How about uh, when you were little? Before you could do like a, you know, a job or a, I mean, do you, do you, do you remember when you were little? Well, it depends how little, because by the time I was five, six, seven, I was riding my bike everywhere and my mom had a fog horn and she would honk the horn once that meant come home. She would honk the horn twice. That meant don't even bother, you're dead. Because <laughs> you didn't come home for honk number one. Um, and so I was always out, always on my bike, as in the house as little as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't know meditation. I didn't know that we could, um, that we could take control of our, of our inner topography or inner geography. I didn't know any of that really until I started getting out of the house, first learning it from a sports psychology point of view. So I didn't have those kind of coping mechanisms, nor did I have many friends that I hung with regularly. It was, I was very solo um, in my early years because I probably, well, let's be honest, you want to pick on somebody who's really reactionary because that makes it more fun. And I was that kid. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't know how to control my inner environment. So if you picked on me, 
I was going to respond mm-hmm. and, and they could have some real fun with that. So I didn't have a lot of friends mm-hmm. growing up. Did you have any support systems with the school, with your teachers, or was there anybody that kind of took you under their wing? I think of people with ADD as having what I like to call a faster than normal brain which means that you process really fast and, and trying to get you to, you talked about a square peg into a round hole, trying to get you to sit in a classroom and, and have your brain work how other kids work. I, I like to say my brain is a shotgun approach. You know, I may get A to G, but I may go A, Q, R, B, P, G and somebody else is going to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's just a different way that brains work. And I don't think our educational system is equipped to handle that. Would you agree? Oh, it, it, the irony is my mom uh, was a special needs teacher. <laughs> oh, geez. Oh, so, um, but it's, it's much easier when people are more distant from yourself. But thankfully, she did get me some assistance because I was such a, uh, well, they would, it wasn't so much that I was a discipline problem. But I was being shamed into fitting in. So first grade, I was sent back to kindergarten. Second grade, I was sent back to kid to first grade or sent to the principal's office. And eventually a kid would turn out bad if, they're keep, if they keep being told how useless they are, how worthless they are, what's wrong with them, which is why I wrote a book years ago, College Confidence with ADD, helping students uh, with learning challenges, which really to me is, is what I call a hyper creative mind. Um, I, I look at them as amazing opportunities. And, and I, I must say, I've gone on to a couple master's degrees. I've gone on to tremendous success. Early on, two things got me. Um, well, one clearly, so I guess three things. One clearly is sports. The more active I was, the more I could quiet my mind. That was my meditation. And then at age 10, um, I was being still shamed into not being able to write properly. I would flip my letters. I would reverse letters. I would reverse words. They'd say, slow down. They'd smack me with a ruler on the hand. They'd tell me, you need to, you need to focus more. And I would get jittery. And like just getting me to sign a book today. Oh, here, a best-selling author. And I'll just be like, oh God. And at age 10, I asked for a typewriter. And I got my mom's old manual typewriter. This is when this was before the first PC. This is before the Mac computer. Um, a few years later, I'd get to use what's called a TRS-80 with a cassette and a Commodore PET computer that I think also used a cassette before disk drives. But at this time, I got a manual typewriter. My mom taped over the keys. I taught myself how to type. And I was the only fourth grader turning in typed papers. And Julie, I could do no wrong. I could write the worst paper in the world. I was good at writing, but I could write the worst papers in the world. But because they were typed, I was getting A's. And that saved my, the official term is patootie. Hold that thought for a minute, Michael. We're going to need to take a break. When we come back, I want, I want you to tell our listeners who have kids that maybe have the same opportunities that you did as a kid, what they can do as parents to help you. And then I want to get into your career as a professional athlete and where that went. So hang on, everybody. We'll be right back right after the break. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Ask Julie Ryan show. We're talking with Michael Sandler, who is uh, is my favorite Phoenix rising from the ashes kind of a guy who's brilliant and a professional athlete. And before the break, we were talking about how um, you had challenges as a kid and you were labeled ADD, which I think you were just brilliant and they didn't know what to do with you. And so I was asking, is there something that I, you had talked about that you got a typewriter and you started typing term papers and that saved you, but is there something that you can suggest to moms and dads with small children and children really at any age throughout school that can help them that that perhaps you learned through overcoming all of the challenges that you face? Three key things, Julie. One, 
protect the child's self-esteem above and beyond anything else, no matter what. Nothing else matters. Number two, protect your relationship with the child. It doesn't matter what their grades are. It doesn't matter what the room's like. It doesn't matter any of the habits. If you don't have a pipeline of love and communication, your ship is sunk. So that's number two. And number three, find something they love to do. I don't care what it is, if it's digging holes in the backyard, if it's racing bicycles, if it's origami, if it's whatever. And you help them to do that to the maximum ability because if they get good at any one thing, they will figure out how to carry it over into other areas of their life and that will protect their esteem so that they don't think I'm a square peg in a round hole. I must be broken. Instead, they'll realize their brilliance in one area. Doesn't mean they won't be challenged in other areas. But if you can latch on to success, if you can see what it feels like, then you're able to translate it over to other areas. Great advice. I love that. And I think moms and dads of kids who don't have learning challenges or ADD or whatever, those all apply there as well. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. And, and today, and, and I don't even like using the term ADD anymore because I, I completely rewired my mind. And I see that we can all completely rewire our minds. But this is such a chaotic, topsy-turvy, flipped upside down world. And, and my belief is that the majority of school systems out there mean well, but everybody Every child is a square peg in a round hole. It's not how we're meant to learn. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think the education system is antiquated and it, it's, it's being revamped. It's because of COVID. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're having to do that. I, I have a friend that is a, she's a big deal and she has the opportunity to figure out how people learn online. I mean, she's an executive vice president of a company we would all know. And I said, oh, my God, girl, no pressure here. You know, you are going to have the opportunity to affect humankind throughout the world for generations to come. And she said, yeah, I know. She said, and and we're starting from square one because it used to be online learning was an adjunct to classroom learning. Now, online learning at all ages is going to be in some instances, the main way to learn. And then the classroom learning may be secondary. So it's interesting watching it unfold. And I think we're being forced to do that. So let's, let's go pivot a little bit into professional athlete. Tell us about that. Tell us about some of your adventures in that phase of your life. So there I went from, I went to the Colorado College in Colorado Springs near the Olympic Training Center, trained at the Olympic Training Center, got invited to race bicycles in Europe. And uh, this was prior to Lance Armstrong. Actually, he came into the Olympic Training Center right as I was heading off to Europe. And um, it was in a phenomenal adventure. It was a wild, wild west of a time. I don't think cycling has ever probably left that wild, wild west of a time I got over to Europe and I was isolated by myself for over a month before I met with the, uh, the team Smollier, not Smollier, I can't even remember the word, Swanier, Swanier. Were you in uh, France? Where were you? Belgium at this point, the team masseuse. And the team masseuse says, what drugs would you like? I'm like, well, what do you mean? He goes, I work for Merck. I can get you good American drugs. What would you like? And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> and that actually started a, an amazing season of racing, but never being welcomed onto my team. Oh. Because I wasn't um, in with the way it worked. And it was interesting because they had to invite me to this really big race after whatever happened and too many riders were sidelined or couldn't do it. And it was in a sense me versus the team. I beat all my teammates, but it was kind of me versus the team. And it was, again, me as lone wolf. I hadn't figured out how not to be lone wolf, although there was a good reason for it this time, Julie. I'm very glad I didn't didn't take the bait. Uh, The next- I think it's fascinating that you beat your teammates who were roided up. (laughs) I mean, really just on your own. I mean, my goodness, what a, what a, 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 
God, what a uh, success story mm-hmm. that is. Because, and I do remember watching stories about Lance Armstrong and his teammates saying that they felt pressured into using the drugs. Interesting. Yeah. It, it was, it was a, if you use them, you're in. If not, we go away on you. And you're, you're all alone in Belgium by yourself, not speaking the language. What are you going to do? Um, so it made for a very unique experience. I, it's been my MO, I am much better at it now, but my MO is to do too much. And I raced my little heart off over there and probably would have done much better that season had I done less and thought of quality over quantity, but I just wanted the experience. Mm -hmm. I came back to the States. I built my own little racing team. I brought my team back to Belgium on on the, the second year. Um, that was a very challenging experience, but I was more on my own. Um, I ended up toward the end of the season on my own. That racing team broke up. I didn't have the, the facilities, the social skills to keep a team together for that long. And I ended up racing for a French team in the French Alps. And one day I didn't think I was going to get to go to this big race. And so my cousin had been visiting. He had come up from Spain where he was studying. He's a cyclist too. And we were going to go hike uh, Mount Blanc this one morning. And um, instead, I get a phone call saying, we've got an opening. Would you like to come do the race today? And I turned to my cousin. I'm like, well, we were planning Mount Blanc. And he's like, you got to go. And I said, all right, I'll see you in a few hours. Unless I get hit by a car or something. All right, hold there. We got to take a break. Everybody, you're listening to the Ask Julie Ryan show. When we come back, Michael's going to tell us about it, maybe getting hit by a car. I don't know, but we'll see. So stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to the Ask Julie Ryan show. I'm Julie, your host, and we're talking with Michael. And Michael's going to tell us about what he when he was professionally racing in France. And he said, OK, I'm going to do this race unless I get hit by a car. Right. What happened? Did you get hit by a car? Of course I got hit. By oh, a car. Geez. Oh. I was waved by a safety official, French official. There's a huge crowd. Vous allez, vous allez, American. Ah, oh. And a woman, had, a elderly woman had managed to get her full size Peugeot automobile down an alley onto the race course, closed race course. And the safety official waved me through a blind turn. There's a giant crowd. And I come through the turn and there's a car headed straight for me. Oh, and, and that was in many ways the end of my professional career. A decade later, I would come back and, and do some cool stuff. I beat the Olympic team on the track. I did some really cool stuff. But that was the end of my career. The car hit me. I flipped up and over. I landed and I'm like, I'm all right. And then I looked down at my left leg. And I don't know if you've ever seen, I wouldn't recommend a movie like this, but if you've ever seen the movie Misery, Julie. And in the movie Misery, this, this crazy woman, something baits, she takes and she locks these guys' legs into some sort of locking device and takes a sledgehammer and knocks them sideways. Oh, jeez. Um, and uh, I spent, thank God, I wanted to bite my teeth into this pavement. I was in so much pain. Thank God I didn't. I, instead, I dug my hands in and it was weeks to get the asphalt out from under the nails. They left me uh, for observation after they took eight people to cold set my lower leg, uh, they left me in a, in a hallway screaming for almost eight hours. They moved me up to one room toward the end before they give me any painkillers because they wanted to observe. And I remember the bed had this triangle thing and I'm trying to fold the bed in half. I'm in so much pain. And I thought to myself, if I had a gun, I'd take myself out right now. Mm-hmm. I had PTSD for six and a half, seven years after that. I had massive back pain and I thought to myself, God is dead. There is no God. And um, I was dating a Native American girl for a lot of that time. And I started to go to uh, ceremonies on the earth, peyote ceremonies. There is a... um, uh, a shaman or a medicine man. There's drumming from sunset to sunrise. 
And I started to heal when I started in those ceremonies to feel there was something more than me. Mm-hmm. That I, I, I'd grown up as, as a Jewish kid who went to Catholic daycare, Jewish Hebrew school, Catholic high school, Hebrew school along the way. I had this hodgepodge of many religions, but I never felt anything until I was sitting on the earth and the drums are going and I felt a connection to something greater than myself. That got me through that time. Well, you, you first of all, are the bionic man. I know you have a lot of titanium in you. What do you have? Like a couple of titanium hips and femurs and... All that good stuff. All that so, good stuff. And, <laughs> and, and there's I, a center of surgical devices sold throughout the world. And I mean, I've been in the bazillions of surgeries where they implant that stuff. And then as a medical intuitive, now I see it when I scan somebody. But it's interesting when I scan you, Michael, and when I scan others that have titanium in them, I don't, it doesn't show up on my radar because it doesn't have the life force in it because it's metal. Mm -hmm. What shows up on the radar in my mind's eye, I'm like a human MRI. And what shows up is the bones and the tissues and stuff like that. But the energy, of the spirit is not in the titanium, which is fascinating. So that's how I can tell somebody's got, you know, a, an implant of some kind. Well, I know you've had a couple of, you, you alluded to it with your Native American experiences, but I know you've had some, sp- what I would call spiritual or paranormal experiences. Can you tell us about a couple that really were tremendous, uh, had a tremendous effect on your life? Give us a little bit of, of the details. I've had two NDEs, and the first one of those, um, I was training for a cross-country skate, for a world record skate, 4,000 miles in 40 days to help students with learning disabilities and attention deficit disorder. And I've been praying and meditating in a creek for safety and guidance. After a skating session, I've been listening to Dr. Wayne Dyer, uh, his book, I think it was Inspiration, talking about how everything in life happens for a reason laced up my skates, said, go, go slow, Michael. It's a Sunday. There'll be tourists out. And I rounded a bend and a, a father is stepping out onto the path in front of me, teaching his baby how to walk. And I, I like to say I had a choice to hit the baby or hit the deck, but nobody hits a baby. It was just some sort of gut visceral reaction. I don't even know how I did it to jump up and backwards and try to rotate like an Olympic high jumper to get out of the way so I didn't hit them. And I remember going through the air thinking, am I still going to be able to do my, and then just crack. The whole world went silent. It was a blissful, perfect, peaceful moment. I didn't get tunnel. I didn't get pyrotechnics. I got bliss. I got heavenly. I got downloads i got joy i got perfection i got awesomeness i got miracle city to where i land and i've I've exploded my hip my femur my arm my wrist and i look and the boy is okay didn't hit the boy dad's okay didn't hit the dad sun still shining fingers work toes marginally work i had to flip the left leg over the right because pieces of bone were trying to stick into the femoral artery and i would have bled to death and I had, Julie, the biggest ear grin you have ever seen. I was in heaven. That's where my woohoo came from. I felt such joy, such love, such peace, such oneness, but not like I'm one with the tree, just like I got the big picture yeah. in that moment. The interesting thing about you talking about this right now, Michael, for those that are watching on this on video and so for those of you that are listening, your energy field is massive. There's this aura around you that I can see and it's gone out so far with you talking about this NDE experience. And, and, And to those of you that don't know what NDE is, near death experience is, it's when a person has a, a experience where their body separates from their spirit. And a lot of people see all kinds of different visions. They end up in heaven. They experience maybe a religious figure or seeing deceased loved ones. 
But the thing that's so interesting about near-death experiences is they, they have so many commonalities across cultures, across languages, across socioeconomic uh, segments that are the same, that there's no way that people are going to make this stuff up and then have it be correlated with people on the other side of the world who don't have anything in common with them. And there are just thousands and thousands and thousands of those. And I talk about that in my book, Angelic Attendance, and a lot of the stuff that I see how we're surrounded by angels and deceased loved ones. Many people that have NDEs talk about that, that they see that as well. So I know you you say that you've seen a UFO as well. What was that all about? So that was that was just me as well. So UFO seen in the physical plane was me as a kid, like 10 or 11, driving through, uh, I guess, Cross Bronx Expressway. I'm a kid. I'm in the backseat. And I'm seeing all these zipping lights coming on. Where is this? Where is uh, this taking place? Just by the Statue of Liberty okay. um, in New York City. And that night they reported it was a mass UFO sighting. So I wasn't the only one to see all these lights zipping around by the Statue of Liberty. Um, and then... Much, much later, um, I was in a, a, a shamanic uh, uh, ceremony with, with ayahuasca. So, so we can say I was certainly being guided somewhere else. So do we say I saw something or not? But I was able to speak with spirits who we would say are in UFOs who said that they're protecting us at each moment and that it's a thankless job and they're helping humanity to keep from blowing itself up. All right. So when you were healing your body from all these injuries that you've had with being the bionic man that you are, did prayer come into play? Did spirituality come into play? Did meditation come into play? What was your uh, procedure that you came up with that you devised, I'm sure with the help of medical professionals and others? to heal your, yourself, not only physically, but also emotionally. You mentioned you had PTSD for all those years. I have been gifted with being injured a lot. And hopefully that doesn't continue, but that's been a gift. And so I learned early on, first off, I'm in charge of my body, nobody else is. That if I focus on an area of body that I can help it to heal. If I go quiet and I bring light to that area of the body, I can help it. If I go into chant and meditation and prayer, I can help the body to heal. The body is an incredible self-healing mechanism if we give it half a chance. So there's meditation, there was visualization, there was prayer, not to the, I pray to the angels now, there wasn't to the angels then, but there was prayer, there was chanting, there was time in nature, all of these things. And there was, there was uh, writing things out and, and even more visualization work. I just knew that if I brought energy and focus to this part of my body that needed healing, it would heal and perhaps go on to be even the strongest part of my body rather than the weak link. Okay. Well, I always tell clients and I tell my students in my class too, classes that I teach quarterly, I say, look, the body's going to follow what the brain shows it, even if the brain doesn't believe it. And an example of that is think of a time when you watched a scary movie on TV. You know, your brain was pretend, but your heart might have felt like it was getting ready to jump out of your chest at any given moment. And I think that's a great example of showing that, that the body's going to follow what the brain shows it. When we come back from the break, I want to talk a little bit more about that. And then I want to talk about, about how you pivoted from being an athlete to being a teacher because you're a teacher now to people around the world. Everybody, you're listening to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. Stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. I'm Julie, your host, and we're talking with Michael Sandler, and we were talking about how he healed his body from all the injuries that he had. And from a spiritual perspective, you did meditation, you did all those things. Do you think that we have the ability to create our own reality? with our thoughts and how do you think that works? So mind to me is definitely creator. That's a new thought term, mind is creator. And I truly believe that. However, I don't believe in a vindictive universe where if you're having bad thoughts, you're gonna have an anvil fall on your head. And, and conversely, it's all within uh, a uh, Indian woman told me the Sanskrit term. And I haven't been able to find it exactly, but something to the, the, uh, the concept is 
close to what's called prahaptma karma. And prahaptma karma means that we have a soul contract, that we can, we have a lot of wiggle room within our particular soul contract. But if your soul contract is not to be an NBA star because you're four foot eight, then you may not be an NBA star, no matter how great your manifestation skills are. Okay, maybe they can be great enough, but chances are it's within this bandwidth. Or when I had my service dog, Sawa, and I rescued her, she was on a run. She could run up and down this lead before I got her. And she could run to the side a little bit. That's our ability to manifest or create but it's still going to be along this particular timeline. With that said, we can rock it in this timeline. We can have it easy. We can have it tough. We can have it incredibly abundant. We can have it incredibly challenged or struggling. So we do have a lot of wiggle room based on where we place our focus with our mind. And it's why if we get there, um, I teach some process called automatic writing. A lot of it depends on how much we are in alignment with our higher selves, with our path, with our purpose, with the plan of the universe. I agree. And my interpretation of that, which I think goes along the same as what you just said, but it's a little bit of a different spin is I believe we come in with a basic script of something we want to explore. And then we'll repeat that script over multiple lifetimes to look at it from a different perspective. For instance, The movie A Star is Born that was out a couple of years ago with Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. That was a fourth remake of that movie. I saw in high school the Barbara Streisand, Chris Christopherson version. Same script, different timeline, different cast of characters, a few different nuances, looking at things from a different perspective in a different era, if you will. And so that's what I find that will do that when I do past life scans with people. That's what we find. There are correlations in the basic script. They're exploring it in a different gender, certainly in a different time, in a different capacity, in a different place. And so I think I agree with you. That's along the same lines of what you're talking about. So I've heard you talk about the golden thread. What is that? Well, the golden thread is if you look back at your life, you will see patterns, you'll see habituations, you will see structural pieces that have taken place over and over again. Just like you're saying, because we can learn lifetime after lifetime, but we are also presented the same opportunity time after time within this lifetime, either until we get the message or it may be a lifelong thread that no matter how well you learn this lesson, you keep getting it, but at a higher perspective. And at a higher perspective, like going around and around and around the mountain. So you see it from a low perspective in the trenches. And then you're a little bit more awake and aware and you see it here. And then you're even more awake and aware and you get it again and you go, but I thought I healed this. Mm -hmm. But it's all the journey. It's all learning. It's like you said, that's our soul contract that we signed up for is how many different ways can I see this? How much can I learn from it? You're not being tested. You're not being smited. You're not being seen if, well, did you get it this time? but you are learning and growing and expanding and learning and growing and expanding. And if you can view it that way, sort of like if you watch the movie, the matrix and you see the black cat twice and they, that, that deja vu is a glitch in the matrix. If you can realize that you're just witnessing part of this amazing fabric, this amazing, if you want to go star Trek holograph or, or, or what was the room? The um, holodeck. Yeah. And realize that's what your life is. It frees you from the experience and you can start studying it from more angles. All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk to Michael about what he did in particular to heal his body. I know he's really into nutrition. So stay with us. You're asking, you're listening to the Ask Julie Ryan show. We'll be back right after the break. When I scan somebody that has high blood pressure issues, I always recommend the Zona Plus. It's a device that you squeeze with your hand. It reminds me of a video game controller that the kids use, and it helps regulate your blood vessels. It was realized working with fighter pilots that when they were going mock, they were taught to grab the joystick in the cockpit and squeeze it really hard. And they realized that it was regulating some of those pilots' blood pressure. 
So they came up with that technology in a device that we can use at home. So give it a try. It's called the Zona Plus, and you can go to Zona, Z as in zebra, O-N-A dot com. And at your checkout, put in the coupon code, just put in Julie Ryan, all together, no space, and you'll get $50 off. So give it a try. Welcome back to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. I'm Julie, your host, and I'm um, talking with Michael Sandler, who is just an extraordinary guy and has all these many, many talents that he uses to help people enhance their lives. And so, Michael, we talked about all these accidents that you've been in, and can you tell us in particular what some of the methods were that you use to help you heal? So I'll go back uh, to my first accident that I was consciously involved in the healing process. And, and that was after coming back from racing bicycles in Europe for my first year. Um, it was September, I think it was beginning of September, and I was doing a uh, mountain bike ride with a, a dear friend, Joe, and a couple other people. Joe is so cool, and he's, he passed away only a few years after that, uh, oh. a, a tragic accident. Um, after he turned his whole life around, it was really cool what he had done with his life. So I lead down this mountain bike path and, and sure enough, one of those incidents happens in life with me um, where a motorcycle was on the mountain bike trail coming mm. up and hit me head on. Oh. And I cracked my skull and I, I got knocked out, not a near death experience, but the guy's pulling his motorcycle off him, off me going, I killed him. I can't believe I killed him. And I'm like, Au contraire. Um, but one of my injuries was my kneecap was split in two. And you, you don't operate. You give that time for it to come back together. Well, my whole, my whole college team was going on this bike ride to Aspen three and a half weeks later. And I wanted to do this ride. And so what I did is I took an imaginary pen in my mind's eye. And I would go quiet and I just spent, I don't know how long a day. I was a college kid, 10, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. I don't even know how long I did, but I just kept on writing with light over my cracked kneecap every single day. And I did my kneecap. I did my wrist was broken. I did that as much, well, but less on my wrist than my knee. And I got back into the doctor's office after three weeks and it was dumbfounded because my knee had healed. In fact, there was a white line, I guess, which doesn't come in until much later of where the healing of bone has taken place. And I had filled it in and I got to do the bike ride. So what do you equate that to? What do you think happened? Well, I can equate it on so many levels. First off, we're energy. So if you're going to bring energy to an area, you're going to accelerate healing. Secondly, I was bringing love and light to this, believing that it was going to heal and glue it together. That had an effect. I was picturing it whole. That had an effect. So while I didn't have the mechanism at the time to say, angels, guides, light workers, God, somebody please heal this. It's all energy. I don't need the words. And so I was bringing focus and attention. And we talked about earlier, mind is creator be damn careful of what you say because that is what you're helping to bring about. What was I saying is I'm going on this bike ride. My knee is healed. My knee is healed. When I had my NDE, my first near death experience and I was in the hospital and I clicked a selfie and my doctor is aghast because he's going, Michael, I've got to get you into surgery right away or you're going to lose your leg or lose your life. And I told him, don't worry, doc, it's going to go back together better than you ever expected it would. And I knew, I mean, we're talking about, I could lose my leg and never be able to walk again. I run mountains now. I knew it was going to go back together. And the next day he comes in and he throws up an x-ray on the light box in the room. And he goes, Michael, Michael, you're never going to believe it. And this is a very subdued orthopedic surgeon. And he's tapping on it. He goes, it went back together better than I ever expected it would. Mind is creator. I was told at age 12, you have so much arthritis, you're going to be lucky to be walking by the time you're 18. I went on to become a pro professional cyclist. Mind is creator. What are you feeding yourself with? And I know you mentioned nutrition, but now I'm talking about the spiritual nutrition or about what are the words you're sharing with your mind. 
If uh, oh yeah, and I as an, a medical intuitive use stem cell energy all the time in healing, and it looks like a light amber colored gel has sparkles in it, of course, because it's woo woo, and it has a watery consistency to it. And I watch it, I watch it make organs that have been removed, like form a new kidney. I watch it heal bones. I watch it bring in new brain matter after scar tissue has been removed energetically in healings. And there are, there have been many times throughout the years where the healings show up on x-rays <laughs> and the dogs are going, okay, wait a minute. What Scott, what's up with this? There's no way this could happen this fast, or there's no way you had a kidney removed. Now we're showing there's a kidney that's showing in the scans and I have people that doctors that have called me over the years and say, all right, what are you doing blood patient? How does this stuff work? And I explain it to them. And, and what I believe I'm watching is what the body does on itself when it regenerates cells. You know, every cell is a nucleus. Every nucleus is surrounded by cytoplasm. Cytoplasms are watery gel. Our bodies act as mini nuclear reactors and we, we can divide and, and replicate cells. And that's what you were doing with your mind and you believed and the mind has just such a tremendous capacity to go past the limits that we have. I mean, you know, think about the explorers for heaven's sakes, the world is flat. What's going to happen if we go past yeah. Spain, right? Yeah. That kind of thing. So great. And then did you, did you use nutrition with that as well? Nutrition's nutrition's been a um, poor. Nutrition was a part of my early life. <laughs> <laughs> then at some point we switched that around. Perhaps it was because I had so many blood sugar challenges um, and so many blood sugar crashes, and I was pre-diabetic for so many years. As a child, uh, as a child, uh, though they didn't know what it was, they knew I was hypoglycemic. They knew I had blood sugar crashes. They knew I had meltdowns, which they didn't realize was my blood sugar crashing. Right. Right. Um, and I figured that out, um, really started to understand nutrition around age 30, 31. I'm back in grad school. They've got me back on medication. I've been off for, for 15 years, but I was taking two simultaneous master's degrees, an MBA and a second in computers, and my brain was locking down. And I had to start to understand my mind on a new level. I had to understand my blood sugar, what's going on. And so I started to go down a more organic road. I'd been a vegetarian or vegan for a long time, I, but I was more of a processed food one. And so I started to understand that better. I started to uh, dive into Ayurveda and the doshas. And just everybody's body is unique. Everybody's microbiome is unique. But I started to take on studying my body, studying nutrition, getting away from uh, synthesized foods, uh, getting away from sugar, getting away from um, artificial this, artificial that. Um, I've gone back and forth. I'm back there now, but eating more of a higher fat, but a healthier fat diet and looking at all the colors of the rainbow, but staying away from processed foods. Well, the sugar, if you were a sugaraholic as a kid, that's why you had arthritis in your joints as a child, because it's inflammatory. And that's what causes the inflammation. It's interesting when I scan somebody that has arthritis in their joints, Michael, it can look like salt crystals that you put in a salt grinder before you grind it up, or it can look like corrosion on a pipe under your sink, maybe that has a water, little bit of a water leak, that white crunchy stuff. And that's what it looks like in the operating room too, on the scope, on the scans, you know, when they've got it up on the monitor, if somebody's being scoped, it's pretty wild to see that. And it's all from inflammation and infl and sugar is one of the most inflammatory things that we can ingest. So how did you break the sugar addiction? There's lots of sugar addicts out there. I'm a recovering sugar addict. Two years without sugar. Number one, don't have it in the house. Yeah. So if I want to break anything, I have to take myself out of the current environment. And if I can't move to a different house, then I better not have anything in that environment that will entice me. And so 
I will go in, well, now with COVID, I would drive to the store. It doesn't kind of work the same way. But, but pre-COVID, I, I would uh, not put it in the cart. And if you don't put it in the cart, then when you get home and you want it, it's not available to you. Right, right. And so that was the biggest thing. Now, when I was on Maui and working to heal this, I made a commitment to myself. First off, I went raw vegan, not necessary, but I went raw vegan. And you can, to me, only do that in a warm climate. And it depends on your constitution. I was vata, not ideal for it. Um, but I said nothing on the uh, glycemic index over 50. And so the majority of fruits were out and your processed carbs were out and almost everything was out of the diet, mm -hmm. but it worked. And, and now I can meter if I desire. I, my favorite food still in the world is a brownie. It's very rare that I have one, but I'm okay with that. And I know how to meter that now. I used to live on a tray of brownies a day. I was so addicted to that oh. stuff. But they were vegan brownies. They're so happy. They were not healthy, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, I hear doctors talk about the, the uh, soda and chips vegan diet. Yeah, totally. you know, just because it doesn't have animal products and it doesn't mean that it's healthy. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you broke your sugar addiction. And when you did that, did you find that it affected your brain? Was your brain clearer? All of it affected my brain, every single thing. And so starting about 30 is when I started to really rewire my mind. And so nutrition was a key component. Meditation was a key component. Becoming more hyper aware of what's that feeling? Oh, I feel like I'm spinning right now. Why am I spinning? What, what did I eat? When did I last eat? Specifically, what can you tell me about what you ate? And so becoming really sensitive to what my body is trying to tell me about the foods that I'm eating. To where now I, I do, it started with muscle testing and I'll still do that, but I would go into grocery stores. Hold that thought for a minute. We're gonna to need to take a break. When we come back, we'll finish that. Everybody, you're listening to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. Stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. We're talking with Michael Sandler about how he broke his sugar addiction while living on Maui, mind you, and, and, uh, and what he went through to get him off of eating a tray of vegan brownies every day. That sounds like nirvana to me. I always say my favorite food group is dessert. So, all right. So you were talking about how you did that and then you got off of that and, and you realized that you were really paying attention to what you were eating at any given time. And So it, I, I would go into the grocery store in, in, in Maui. If, if anybody's familiar with Maui, there's a, a famous holistic grocery store called Mana's. And I would go into Mana Foods and I would put food up to my heart or up to my gut. And I'd say, how does this make me feel? Uh -huh. Or I would take A and B. Do I want A? Do I want B? And Jessica, my wife, she would test it too. We'd always get the same answers. And it would be so frequently that I'd be like, Duh, no, because I wanted something. I wanted something so badly. I'm like, oh, I can get away with having X, Y, or Z. And you close your eyes and you listen and you feel your body. And it will tell you very, very clearly. So you take a package of Twinkies and hold it up to your heart and then- Oh it would man, say, if I took Twinkies, I would just get a, a sucker punch to my gut right really? away. There's no way I could do it. No way. You put huh. that to your body and you ask, body, do you want this? Not, not uh, gut bacteria gone awry, do you want this? Body, do you want this? And you feel into it, you will know. You just know. Interesting. I never heard of that technique before, but it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so you physically held the food up to your body? Absolutely. It was touching your body or it was just close by? You, typically, well, I could do it two ways. I could touch, the, touch it or like I could close my eyes, stand there, and Jessica could put one thing up to my heart and then pull it away and it doesn't even have to touch me and put a second thing up because if it touches me, I'm gonna to try to determine size and shape and all these things and put the second one by me and it was always consistent. It was always consistent. And sometimes you would look at something organic 
And you go, but it's organic. Why? And then you read and you find there's like hidden MSG or something in it. There's a reason for it. Yeah. Well, it would be interesting too, even with whole food, because there are certain whole foods that work with people's gut biome and certain that don't. Like when I had my gut biome checked, I'm not supposed to eat cauliflower because it ferments in my gut. I think cauliflower, that's supposed to be really healthy, but you know, didn't, isn't for me. Ha, ah, interesting. I'm going to try that. What's also interesting along these lines, because I'm now I'm doing the Viome test is the company. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm getting a sponsorship from them. And, right. and what's interesting to me is when our gut bacteria goes awry, we can crave something that under normal circumstances might be good for us, but we want it too much because our microbiome is out of order. So, so like when we were on Maui, the ultimate irony is we were making uh, vegan coconut kefir and cultured nut butters and kombucha and all of these things. And when you would make kefir and you would pour sugar into your coconut water, it would foam up, it would come to life. That's what happens in your gut bacteria when you give it something particularly out of balance or something sugary. And so you can be going, like I noticed a few months ago, uh, the Viome test said, um, Blueberries are your superfood. All right, cool. Let's eat lots and lots of blueberries. What I usually do, but I didn't because I was trusting the Viome test, is I usually say, ooh, you really want blueberries. You really want blueberries. You really want blueberries. Why? And if I want something too much, I need to step back and ask why. And chances are something's gotten out of balance. I trusted the Viome test, and it's a really good test. And so I ate blueberries, 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 blueberries. And then I did the next test because you do it every 90 days. And it said, <laughs> blueberries is now on my um, uh, banned foods list. Really? Why? I ate too many blueberries. Because it, it upset the balance in your gut with too Bingo. much sugar, even though it's so, such low glycemic? Or maybe not so much sugar, but it fed a particular strain of bacteria in my microbiome too much and it got out of balance. And what that means is our bodies are always seeking balance. Everything is seeking balance. When you see something out of balance, even if you think, well, this is good for me, it's okay to have and have and have and have and have. It's important to stop, take yourself out of hyperdrive, take the Millennium Falcon uh, out, of, uh, out of its hyperdrive warp speed, forgive me everyone. And it's important to ask, why am I wanting this so much? And is that truly what my body needs? Mm -hmm. Well, and I've heard you say that you were a lot heavier before as well when you were eating a lot of sugar and even vegan. And so did, have you found that your weight just has stabilized? I mean, I know you do a, a huge amount of exercise, but for, for, for those of us that are mere mortals, Michael, with your weight more or less will stabilize to what you believe your weight will stabilize at. Oh, big statement. So I was a tra so when I raced to uh, bicycles in Europe on the road, I was 142, 145 pounds. A decade later, when I raced and beat the Olympic team on the track, I was 200 pounds. When I rode my bicycle across the country solo unsupported, I was 175 pounds. And now I am about 140, 142 right now, almost no matter what I do. I have picked, we don't realize, we do it with our subconscious. I have picked a set point and I will stay at that set point. Now, recently we've been moving a lot of stuff with the RV and, and getting stuff into storage and I need to bulk up a little bit and I feel a little weak and I'm very strong for my sports, but not for moving. I need to get to be a little, a little bit over 150 pounder. I'm telling my body that now. And sure enough, a month or two down the road, I'm gonna be a much stronger 150 pound guy because I'm choosing that set point. Wow, big statements. All right, so every woman on the planet wants to know the details of this when we come back. After the break, I want to know, all right, how do you do that? What's, you know, what's the easiest <clears throat> way to do that? What do we need to do to support that? 
and and take it from there. So everybody, we're talking with Michael Sandler. Oh my gosh, this is going to be a a major golden nugget. I can feel it when we come back. Everybody, you're listening to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. Stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. We're talking with Michael Sandler. And okay, this is like, we're getting ready to hear some important stuff, everybody. So tune in and, and pay attention here. How do we decide what a set point is for our body? And then what do we need to do to manifest that set point. I mean, I, I know you did that as an athlete. I'm talking about to the women of the world here now. First off, I, w- I wanna say something to be extra kind and gentle to people. Our bodies are out of whack because of the plastics and, and the, uh, the endotoxins that we've taken in uh, or uh, endocrine uh, disruptors that we've taken in. There's things in the plastics that get in the water. There's things in the food. So it is not an overnight switch. And I don't want you to pick on yourself if everything's out of whack and you're going, well, Michael just said, no, be extra loving, kind and gentle to your body. But when you're extra loving, kind, and gentle to your body, you take yourself out of the fight or flight response, which affects your body's blood sugar levels, which keeps you from reaching that new set point in the first place. So loving, kind, and gentle goes a long way to helping. Better sleep goes a long way to helping. But first we need to- What's better sleep mean? Man, get your eight hours of sleep a night. If Is you it get eight less- hours for everybody? I mean, you hear like Martha Stewart sleeps four hours a night. Here's my game. And I tend to be seven, seven and a half lately. Okay. If you get your stress levels down and everybody's different. First understand it's an N of one. In science, that means each one of us is our own, is our own unique experiment. But if you are humming along like the Dalai Lama, you probably need a lot less sleep because you are less burning less nervous energy through the day your tank hasn't been depleted as much at night there's not as much cleanup that has to do in your body in your mind in your soul so to speak at night so it varies from individual to individual but as a general rule when we get out of sync with the natural cycle of the earth when we don't go to bed until late late at night particularly after 10 o'clock because we're living with artificial fire, artificial sunlight, with all of this blue screen time and this blue light hitting us. You are throwing your hormones completely out of whack. Of course, you're eating almost nothing. And the studies show we're eating less now than we were 20 years ago and getting fatter. Why? Everything's out of whack. What's the 10 o'clock thing? What's that all about? The 10 o'clock thing goes all the way back to Ayurvedic science, all the way back 5,000 years ago, that says we have an inner flame, Julie. And this inner flame comes up to digest food, it goes down to rest. It comes up to digest food, it goes down. And it comes back up at 10 p.m. at night, so that not it can digest more food, but so that it can clear out the toxins in the body, in the mind, repair cellular damage. So you're ready to go the next day. The trick is, and 10 o'clock seems to be the sweet spot of if you get to bed before 10, this flame hasn't come up. What does the flame mean? Go check your body temperature and you'll see it cycle throughout the day. Your body temperature, when it goes down at night and you feel a little bit cold, it's time to go to bed. When it comes back up after 10 o'clock, you get the munchies. Your hormone that controls satiation, and I might flip these two in my head here on the moment. This hormone that controls satiation, ghrelin, goes down. So, or ghrelin, your ability, you just want more food. You're hungry, hungry, hungry. Your, uh, Your hormone, or that's your hormone that affects appetite, goes up, ghrelin. Your hormone that affects satiation, lactin, goes down. So no matter how much you eat after 10, you're hungry. And no matter how much you absorb, it's why we get the munchies, not just for food, but for Facebook, for the news, for movies, gimme, 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 and we're never satiated. That inner flame has kicked up. What it's supposed to be doing 
You're supposed to be fast asleep, and that flame is supposed to be clearing out the toxins from your body, digesting anything that hasn't been digested, rewiring the mind and trimming the tree of everything that you don't need so that you wake up rested and refreshed. Instead, we steal that energy after 10. We steal that inner flame. We're wired or twired. We're surfing this, we're surfing that, we're eating this, we're eating that. We've thrown everything out of whack. And now, even if we get 8, 10, 12 hours of sleep, we wake up feeling like a truck hit us. And of course, no matter how little we eat, we're not able to hit the set point we want because we've thrown everything out of whack. Why? We got out of sync with Mother Earth. And Mother Earth has some demands. What are her demands? Number one, live in balance with me. Number two, which goes along with number one, live in balance with me, is when I go to sleep, you go to sleep. When I get up, then it's time to get up. So 10 o'clock is don't get in bed at 10 o'clock, be in bed like by 9.30, 9.45 so you can be asleep at 10 o'clock. I mean, how much wiggle room is that in your world? Well, we all try to negotiate and-, and- <laughs> Running our Inspire Nation show, there are days where I have to do my best negotiation dance I can. But in an ideal world, think of life as camping. Now, hopefully you enjoyed camping as a kid. But what I mean by that is let's dim the lights at night. Let's get things quieter. Let's look at everything we ingest. In fact, if you don't like camping, make it like a spa. And you're about to go in for a spa treatment. So you've got some incense or some safe candles or some gentle music or the sound of a gentle waterfall or pitter patter of rain. No bright lights. If you must be on the computer or the phone, have a blue screen filter on there. Dim everything down. So you don't know. watch TV and then jump in bed at 10 and expect you're going to fall asleep. No, and, and even worse, don't watch zombie TV today. Everything today is about death, is about killing, is about murder, is about mayhem, is about anything what I call negative worthless stimulation news that then your subconscious is going to work on while you sleep and you ask your body the next day, body, why aren't you healing? And your body is like, well, because I was so stressed out and and anxious when I went to sleep last night and that's all you had me work on last night because your mind never sleeps. It will work on exactly what program you give it before you go to bed. And what about waiting a certain number of hours. I've heard two hours or three hours before you go to bed after you eat. Like if you eat it at 10, you don't need to go to bed until 12. If you ate at 10, that's a stimulant. Right. Which means it's going to raise your body temperature, which means you're going to have a little trouble getting to sleep. So can we roll back now real life, maybe real world, maybe we can't, but if we can get that dinner time earlier. If not, I would do like what I did in the Olympic Training Center. So I was trying to raise money to get myself to race in Europe. And so I trained at the Olympic Training Center and then I delivered pizza until the middle of the night. And so I would come back home. It was awful with my pizza, but that was all I had. And I would eat and collapse. If you got to eat late, collapse. Do not pass go. Do not keep yourself up. Go straight to bed. I have never heard that ever. In my life, I always hear you need to wait two to three hours after you eat before you go to bed. Never, never, never. In fact, Ayurveda would say sleep, I believe it's on your left side for digestion. They would say take a nap, even if it's a midday meal, to encourage digestion. Let all systems lie low so that the body can use all of its resources to help you digest. Interesting. All right. So optimal time to eat between 6 and 8 p.m., I would think. I, I would think actually, let's go 5.30 to 7.30, 5.37. The earlier, the better, because we want to get the digestion done before we go to sleep so that inner flame is lowest so we can get the deepest sleep. But I would much rather you go to bed the minute after you sleep than to stay up a minute later. The minute after you eat, you mean? Yeah, if, you're eating, if you're eating at 9.50 and you said, man, this is the only time I have to eat and because of my kids, because of my work, I get it, real world. Eat, sleep, okay. go right to bed. And so then when we go to sleep by 10, then our body has the ability to detox all the toxins and things that are in the environment and in our, our modern day world. It's a rebuilding machine. We just have to give it half a chance. So then how do we decide where we want to set our set point? That comes into belief. We will see what we believe. Not I'll believe it when I see it. It's backwards. 
we will see what we believe. Okay. So if you're running around at 200 pounds and you say, well, I believe I'm 140, ain't happening. If I believe I can stay at a consistent 190 and I visualize that and I write about it and set intention every morning and I look in the mirror and I picture myself, what do I look like at 190? What do I feel like at 190? What's my emotional state at 190? And I'm continuously thinking, I'm 190 now. I'm 190. You will get there. Then maybe we go to 180 or go to 175. But don't try to take the whole mountain on at once. Your subconscious will throw it out. Because Certainly. I'll believe it. Of course. Right. You that's a really, that's a really big point. That's a really big point you just made there to, you know, don't go 40 pounds less, go 10 pounds less. And then when you're there, then ratchet it down. If you've been on the cycle, uh, uh, the, the hamster wheel of diets, and you've lost massive amount of weight only to regain it or more, who are you to believe that this time is magically going to be different? Right. It's not unless we make some magical changes. What's one of them? Well, let's make a micro difference that sticks for a lifetime rather than a massive difference that's going to come back. Let's take tiny little steps and install new software. Okay, we've got that anchored in, sort of like climbing a mountain, rock climbing. Put in one pin. That's good and solid. Let's go up to that level. Feeling good? Looking around? Feel all right? Put in another pin. Rather than try to throw your pickaxe up to the top of the hill, pray that it hooks in there and it's solid and pull yourself up. Little micro gains, loving yourself up in the process, but being intentionally aware each step every morning. Repeat that goal every morning, right from a state of imagining it's already here and feeling that emotional state and giving joy and giving wonder for it. So when I say I'm going- All right, hold that thought. We got to take a break real fast. When we come back, we'll finish that thought. And I want to talk to you about automatic writing, which I got it. play into that. So everybody, you're listening to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. We're talking with Michael Sandler, and we were just talking about how to come up with a set point for weight, which every woman on the planet, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So you were talking about take it down in little increments at a time. And, and that the brain is going to believe it when we do it that way, because all of most of us, I mean, pretty much every woman I know has been on a roller coaster ride with their weight for most of their life. I think I went on my first diet when I was 11. So, and most of us have, and I think kids are younger and younger when they're being told, oh, we need to put you on a diet. Well, they're seven. Okay. Well, that's just nuts. And so. Julie, between you and me, when I was 16 and going to my first national championships, I became anorexic because I was told that you had to be incredibly light to be able to ride better and stuff. And I had such a dysfunctional relationship with food for years and years. I still don't have a scale in the house. I'll hit that point. I'll hit that point to where I could walk in a gym and I'll know it within a pound, but I won't keep it in there and I won't focus on how much I ate. I will allow the body and talk with the body and develop a relationship with my body to hit that point rather than stressing over, well, I've got to eat this much of this and that much of that and how much protein did I have today? And Because then your body goes to a place of fear and in a place of fear, it's in a place of sugar overload because it's got to dump sugar into the bloodstream and it's got to whack out its relationship with insulin because it's got to be ready to run. And then how in the world are you going to hit your set point? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So automatic writing. I know you're a big proponent of automatic writing. Tell us about that. Tell us how we can utilize it in our, in our everyday lives for weight, for set point, for career, for love life, for finances for whatever, winning, winning a bike race, whatever. How do we do it? What kind of effect can we expect? How do we know we're doing it right? So to give you all of that in four minutes, that would be a minor miracle, but I'll well, give you, you have eight minutes. You all, have right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Automatic writing is a process where we go into meditation 
we quiet our mind as best we can. Even the person with the wildest, craziest monkey mind can still do this. We go into prayer, kind of like Alice in Wonderland. We step down the rabbit hole. We get to this sacred space. And we begin asking, you can call it angels, you can call it guys. I, lo I, I love to joke and say the giant cheeseburger in the sky. You can call in, if you're not spiritual at all, probably you're not listening to the show, but it's okay. If you're not spiritual, you can call it your inner wisdom. And you ask, what do I need to know today? And you're in this sacred space where your pen starts writing without thought. At first, it might just be, you are loved or everything is okay. Breathe deep, Julie. Take it easy. And, and the words may not seem that profound because you're, you're, you're more, for some people, about 10% of people, it's actually lyrics and poems and prose, stuff I don't even get all these years later. And we have literally written the book, written the book on it. It comes out in January. But, but with that said, um, for most of us, it's little snippets that come in at the beginning because we're dating. We're dating with the universe. We're dating with the angels. We're creating this relationship. We're creating this handshake. And so we start with the basics. What do I need to know? Who am I? What's the one most important thing that I need to know today? And then we expand it beyond that as we start to develop this relationship with our guides to where we can ask anything. We can ask, where is this pattern coming from? Or if we can't hit that set point, how has this been here to serve me? And what can I do to move past this? What is the subconscious block? What is the wound that I'm dealing with? There's a book from uh, 19, um, is it 1930, I believe it is now. Let's see if I have that right. No, I, but yes, it's 1930. And the doctor started researching it in 1921, 1922. And he said that automatic writing um, was used uh, by Jung, it was used by Freud, in the late, uh, the late 1800s, and then it had gone passe. And he wanted to bring it back because he said he knows of no single tool, and this is almost 100 years ago, that can help you bypass the conscious mind and understand what the subconscious is thinking more than automatic writing. So you can bring anything to it. For Jessica and myself on Maui, we had a, a third of a million dollar book deal. We're living high up on the, on the hill. We can see both sides of the island and the water is coming in and everything started blowing up on us, culminating with my second NDE with another accident with us wiped out financially because I couldn't work because I was getting so injured. Jessica sick with mold toxicity poisoning, us being kicked off of the island. And I go into automatic writing and it's, it's, it's not like, I wish I could say it was, Hello, Michael, we've been waiting for you. It wasn't quite like that. I'm still waiting for that day, Julie. I'm, I'm waiting for, you know, I'm going to find this monk up high up in the Himalayas who's going to say, Michael, we've been waiting for you. And I'm going to go, so cool. However, they're like, dude, you're totally off base. You've been Sisyphus trying to push the stone uphill. You've been missing the mark. Slow down. Let's teach you about yourself. Let's share with you where you get to go. Let's help you co-create that future for yourself and get you more in alignment. Patience, love, dear one, everything is okay. Everything is okay. And it is from that place of love and of, like I say, they use the term maybe dear one, of being held in this embrace, kind of like an angel's wings wrapping himself or herself around you. From that safety cocoon, now you can step forward and now you can ask almost anything that you can imagine. Wow. All right. So just take a pen, start writing. Do you, is it, can you do it on your computer? Can you type it or does it need to be written with your hand and a pen? You, you can do it e either which way. And, and I'm going to make a shameless plug, automaticwriting.com. We have a program that can guide you through all the prayers and all the steps. In the beginning, I did it writing because there is something, and I recommend everybody do it writing at first. There's something kinesthetic. There's something tactile. There's something touchy-feely to it. But again, going back to my learning challenges in my early years, I flip letters, I flip words, it comes out gibberish. So eventually I went to a keyboard, I use an app, it's free, it's 
called Just Get Flux, justgetflux.com. And it allows me to make my screen black and red, like for, for an old school um, dark room so that almost no visible light is emitted. And so I'll go onto my keyboard after I've done my meditation prayers, and I'll basically have my eyes almost completely closed so I'm not stimulated by the screen. And I kind of look a little bit like one of my favorite musicians of all time, Stevie Wonder. Hedge is <laughs> going back and forth. I got to peek every once in a while, make sure that, that there's not like a pop-up thing coming up so I'm actually typing something on the screen. And away I go. And I have to then reread it later in the day because there's an energy, there's a frequency. Yeah. You feel better, you heal from it, even if you don't know what you wrote. But if you read what you wrote, you get some profound words of wisdom. Well, I think of you as kind of like a male Oprah in a lot of ways, because you talk to some of the top thought leaders in the world about this stuff. Is there one thing, because we don't have much time left, is there one thing that you can think of that you want to leave with everybody that out of everybody that you've talked to, is there one, just one thing, if you could only tell us one thing, what would it be? I, I'm very biased. So I'm going to admit my bias, Julie. Every morning, this morning I had to do a, like a 300 mile drive to go get the car worked on before this RV tour in a couple of weeks. Right. And so I had to rush out the door and I still got my automatic writing in saying, angels, guides, light workers. It's like going from journaling to channeling. What do I need to know today? What is most important? Am I on path? And what's the one most important thing for me to know? Because I have got found when we were living on Maui years ago, Jessica and I, my wife and I were getting our butts kicked. No matter how spiritual, no matter how much we meditated, no matter how much we prayed, because we were out of alignment. Yeah, yeah. And I having a tool to get you in alignment to me means everything. I agree. All right. Tell everybody how they can find you. So they can find our show at inspirenationshow.com. They can find automatic writing. And I recommend it. I'm super biased for everybody. I think the whole world would change if we each had a way to communicate and to hear from our angels and guides. That's automaticwriting.com. And we have classes that we offer. And you can find those in boot camps where hundreds of us get together and, and really elevate our consciousness and come together as a group, group meditation, uh, group clearing sessions. That is inspirenationuniversity.com. Of course, we're on YouTube, iTunes, everywhere, Inspire Nation show. Inspire Nation, thank you so much for taking the time to join me. You are one of my favorite new friends, favorite all-time uh, people. Big hug right back to you, right to Jessica too. And uh, I can't say enough good things about Michael, you guys. Check out all of his websites, his classes, all of that. And uh Thanks so much. Much love to you. Have a great tour and sending big hugs and kisses. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you next week. Bye now. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Julie on Instagram and YouTube at Ask Julie Ryan and like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. To schedule an appointment or submit a question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com. This show is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical, psychological, financial, or legal advice. Please contact a licensed professional. The Ask Julie Ryan Show, Julie Ryan and all parties involved in producing, recording, and distributing it assume no responsibility for listeners' actions based on any information heard on this or any Ask Julie Ryan shows or podcasts.